I think we need to take people back to first principles. And that's, what are we doing this education thing for? And when I ask, and I've asked thousands of people this question, if you had the choice between somebody who had a proven higher content recall ability, so scored higher on the test, and you had somebody else who you knew worked their tail off, which one are you gonna pick? And I've never met a serious person who will pick the content person. They will always pick the work their tail off person because you give me somebody who works hard and I will find them something to do. I will find a way to get to where I need to go. It doesn't matter what I'm doing. Uh, you know, the kid that, we're, um, that I hired last summer to do analytics for me at the university. She's a biologist, she didn't do math. Took her a week and a half to figure out how to use Tableau and make these beautiful charts because she sat in front of it. You know why? Because she worked at an ice cream stand for three consecutive summers. And during the interview, she said, she talked to me about the hours she worked and her approach to working. And I was like, one, I can tell you're smart. But that ethic is the piece that I need. So to me, when we look at assessment, we have this idea that somehow a 95 is somehow a cultural good that will provide value to someone in their future. And I have never been asked about my grades in my undergrad, thank God, because um, I took the same approach I have now with my faculty uh, and they didn't like it very much. Um, so my grades were, but nobody cares, right? Um, the one thing that was important for my undergrad was when my prof walked up to me and said, nobody cares, they care how hard you work, very important lesson for this guy. Um, but if we can say, Let's stop measuring this, I got the checkbox things, and let's start finding a way to measure this thing over here. Let's start talking about measuring the effort of people's approaches. Let's start talking about the way they interact in the classroom, the willingness to connect to other people. Those things are still measurable. You can use the same tools to measure these things, but as long as you start to say, and I know this is sacrilegious, I don't care about the content. Like, I don't care about it. It's my job as a faculty member inside of a classroom to bring the content, to organize it, to get people, not bring the content, but sort of coordinate it and recognize it when I see it and make judgments between it and make sure people understand different ideas of value within my industry, within my framework of knowledge. But it's really just the playground wherein we are playing and learning the, the literacies that we need to be able to be effective professionals at that field. So when we look at online learning, the temptation, I just had this conversation about gamification. When we look at it, the temptation is to say, here's a cookie, here's a cookie, here's a cookie. But to give somebody a cookie, you wanna know that they've checked off the box to get to the cookie, right? And then that draws them forward. It's a Khan Academy thing, right? So you got it right, you got it right, you got it right, bing! Right, start to, Pavlov's dog starts to drool. And that's fine, because there are places where if I'm gonna to need to eventually remind myself how to do algebra so I can work with my kids, I'm super glad Khan Academy is there. I will use it. I will reteach myself how to do it and then it'll be fine. But for the things that are important, not to say algebra is not important, sorry. Um, for the things that are really important inside of the work that we're doing, that kind of checkbox approach doesn't lead to anything valuable because our goal in the learning process, I hope, is to get people to the point where they can work hard about things they care about, not that they can remember a bunch of stuff you told them. And unless we make that shift, we're gonna be stuck with the behaviorist stuff all over the place. Because and in the, our bureaucracies are like that, our governments are like that. Not because, you know, I've, we've got some great people in government at, at, uh, in PEI, and I've had some really good conversations with them about it. But at the end of the day, moving that system is not easy. It's a giant weight and it's not easy to push, right? So we've got all of these things that are telling us that behaviorism is trackable and at some points scaling needs to be trackable. But I think it, it requires the courage to sit down in the middle of it and go, you know what? I understand what you're saying. Let's take some pieces and assume they're like that because like I say, some pieces are. And then, but then let's, let's all be honest about what we really care about. And again, it's the same thing. I ask people this question all the time. Do you know the answer 
to how to do your job. And anybody who is serious in a decision-making situation goes, well, not really. You know, it's 70%, it's 75%. So there's no right answer, right? Right. Why are you building an education system that believes in right answers? If we all know that life's not like that. So bringing out and focusing on that almost age-old dichotomy at this point of the knowledge base versus the thinking. Um, and I am a, simply a big proponent of the idea that it is okay to ask students to remember a, a body of knowledge and to learn a body of knowledge in, in their subject area. Um, and I think that these things are not as diametrically opposed as, as we might assume. So there's a little bit of new kind of research out there on the forefront, um, very cutting edge stuff that's showing that sometimes higher thought is complemented by knowing more and learning more, that knowledge more effectively in a subject area. So I, I'm kind of hoping that we can start breaking out of this idea that it's one or the other. And as a teacher, I'm not going to accept that I have to pick one or the other. Now, that said, I don't think there's you know, one area of the brain or one specific mechanism that is critical thinking. And in fact, there's a wide variety of ways people even define critical thinking. Um, but so there's a, a sort of a, a complex uh, and nuanced dance that goes on between what I know about an area, so this, the set of facts that I know, and how I can turn that into um, a good critical application of thought processes in a real, in a real context. And I guess context is another um, hot button issue when it comes to thought processes. So, you know, sometimes we like to tell ourselves, well, I'm going to come in on Thursday and that's the day I teach my students to think and we'll do critical thinking that day and they will be critical thinkers for the rest of their lives. But um, yeah, critical thinking is, uh, it's a mode of thought that you can choose to be in at a given moment or not. Um, there are contexts where we've acquired some expertise, where we tend to engage in more expert thought processes and those same processes we won't in another environment. Um, just because of you know how we're cued or we know a little le less in that area so I don't know how satisfying an answer that is but if nothing else it, it tells us that really from day one kind of thinking about how those two sides of learning interrelate um, is a good thing and yeah not to be not to be phobic of the of memorization you can have both and again with technology it is so much easier to do things like flipping, which is, after all, oftentimes just getting students to master knowledge base so they can come in and we can have that more complex application that, after all, you need the knowledge base for, right? You can't assess complexity in the same way you would assess normal things. My view on that is, from a formal perspective, I would never assess complexity in a classroom. Um, and frankly, we don't now. So I'm not breaking anything. That's the other piece here. When we start talking about assessment, just as an outset, our school system is not perfect as it is. I'm not telling secrets out of school here. It's not perfect. So we can't measure the new vision against perfection, but rather against an imperf already imperfect system. So we don't measure complexity now, I would argue. Some people might disagree. Um, so in, it's my job as the person ostensibly who has a sense of the complexity for the field that I'm in, to bring the complexity. So when somebody makes a simple argument, it's my job to go think a little deeper, push a little further. I wouldn't assess any of that. I just push for it. That's my job. I don't need to know that that person complexity feed 27% more than that person. Because at the end of the day, I don't think that, hmm, this is something I love to tell people. I don't care whether or not you need to measure that. The fact that you need to doesn't make it possible to do. And I don't think it's possible to do, and I think the effort is wasted. Um, not the effort to push complexity, but the, the effort to measure it. I don't think we're gonna get away from measurement. Measure the effort. Make the argument that, I mean, okay, I'm in the States. Make the argument that, that pulling yourself up by your bootstraps is what we've always done. And working hard is what the American dream has always been about and let's stop measuring the content that people remember and measure how hard they work. And then the kid in your class who works their tail off for a 65 
and then ends up becoming a very successful person because working their tail off is actually what they needed to be able to do, becomes somebody who is at the top of the class and somebody who has a photographic memory, sorry Bonnie, who has a photographic memory who does well through grade 12, does well up to a certain point and then goes, oh, wait, complexity. Uh, pfft, I've never had to do any of this stuff. Learns earlier on that they need to be able to be creative in order to be successful. I consider it... Um to a certain extent, entree into the conversation of formative learning in higher ed. I think higher ed could benefit from a more widespread knowledge and practice of formative teaching and learning, whereby assessments are not used to generate grades per se, final grades per se, but assessments are used to improve instruction. So an overall focus on instruction and different pedagogical strategies in higher ed, I think will improve the academy in general. As a psychologist, to me the big picture is the human mind. And you know, here too you read a lot of stuff about how technology supposedly transforms how we think or, or rewires us. And as a psychologist, I, I'm, I don't take that perspective. I think that um, we walk around with minds that are much like the minds that our ancestors had 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago. And so a lot of the basics haven't changed. You know, we take in information that's relevant to our goals, that holds our attention. Um, you know, sometimes we complain when we or our students uh, forget some piece of information that turned out to be important, but most of the time the, the mind's just doing its job when it's not taking in just indiscriminate reams of information about things that don't seem to connect to our goals or emotions or things like that. So I think that's pretty basic. I think human um, reasoning abilities, uh, we have some real weak spots that remain even among very educated, motivated, intelligent people. And so we, when we know about kind of that lay of the land, how we take in information, how we use it, uh, how expertise in an area develops, I think that sort of, of common ground that, that holds a, uh, across a lot of changes um, to you know, higher education, to technology, different teaching techniques and so forth. The, uh, the notion that online learning may not be as good or may not be as effective as other modalities such as in the classroom. You know, if I really wanted to be a wonk, uh, you pull out the body of research that's called the no significant difference phenomenon. For those who really, really, really need to see the data, you can point to the meta-analysis of about a decade's worth of research that really says media types don't greatly influence learning outcomes that's probably overkill. That's probably really carpet bombing for many faculty. The selling point that you usually use with faculty is you have the discussion, well, if you teach a large lecture section, if you teach 100 students, how well do you know each of those students? And the answer is typically, well, I, I really don't. You know, I really don't have time to get to know them as individual learners. And so our hook is to say, that because of the way in which students expose their learning at an individual level in an online course, many faculty tell us they feel they now know their students better in an online course. And we put that out there, and I will say that time after time, faculty prove it to be true uh, through self-reporting, that the connections that they form with the students are indeed far stronger and deeper in an online course than in a large classroom course. There's a lot of tools. Um, I think affordance is the buzzword because um, to have the tool for the right concept to, to be understood um, is exactly what happens with COIL that you have for, for social media, for Facebook to provide an instant translation so that people in Lebanon and people in Ulster County are talking about their experiences in um, uh, uh, refugee work as well as um, fire rescue, as well as deer hunting in both places. I mean, without um, Facebook and that instant translation, that would not happen as easily. So that's a lovely affordance and 
I would also say the LMS provides, you know, whether it be Moodle or Sakai or Blackboard or Angel or whatever it is, but that structure of a place where they're accessing, okay, this is what we're supposed to do together and all the steps and all sort of sort of like the recipe to make it work. That's a, definitely another important component. Another um, affordance I would say is the opportunity at some point, whether even in small groups one-on-one -on -one or face-to-face -to, -face to have that um, connection and to have a, um, a, a actual conversation. And actually it's happening a lot. Um, another affordance is WhatsApp or it's sort of the IMing aspect. Like one Ulster student was saying, her um, WhatsApp account blew up at like six in the morning when they were having this discussion about how do they figure out how to tie up a particular project and get to a place where um, they're ready to present it. And I just, I just love that idea. She said she was like blowing her hair and like getting ready to go to school. And meanwhile, everybody was going back and forth and, and talking about how do, we, how do we get to the next step. So these are, these are tools that are not necessarily expensive. These are tools that we use actually in the business world. And these are tools that they are using in the classroom to prepare them for that business world. So that when they get into um, a situation where they're applying for a job, they're going to have that leg up and they're going to be the one that's going to be hired. The thing with, with critical thinking, I mean, first of all, is we really tend to underestimate just how much work and practice it takes to develop. So psychologists who've studied critical thinking have found, for example, it's not just being able to think critically. There's a huge piece that's knowing when to do it. So for example, I, I might know the difference between correlation and causation in a theoretical sense, but if my friend comes to me and says, oh, I read a study that said vitamin users are healthier than everybody else who doesn't take vitamins, and isn't that great? That, it might not trip that switch in my mind that says, ah, this is the time to tell, <laughs> okay, maybe people who take vitamins were healthier to begin with. It's a correlation causation issue. So that is one where we do need a lot more systematic instruction. And highly traditional classes you know, tend to be so focused on content delivery and the discussion in class that fosters the critical thinking can, can be frankly kind of hit or, hit or miss, um, especially when the, the class size is large. So in an online environment, we can kind of slow the, the process of discussion and deliberation down. And we can introduce more systematic steps, more ways of breaking down not just, you know, what do you believe, what's your opinion or your stance, but why do you believe that? And that is another critical piece of the puzzle, is continually focusing students' um, attention and thought processes on the why. So even something like um, a test system that allows students not just to bubble in A, B, C, or D, but to say, you know, here's why I answered it this way, or allows me to sort out all the responses to a particular question and, and query those students and say, well, technically this answer is wrong, but what's your reasoning? Those can support critical thinking. And what really did surprise me as I, as I got into some of this research is that um, online discussions, those, you know, threaded forums and so on, those are some of the biggest supporters for the deeper thought processes in the whole course. Which is amazing if you're new to, to um, online teaching and learning and you look at these and go, oh, well, that's a lot of chit chat and I totally agree or hi, my name is so and so. Despite all that appearance, that's the place where students can stop, think, and explain. And that's what drives critical thinking. So, you know, really emphasizing those discussion forums, um, being very specific about what we want students to do in them. Um, are, are ways that we can start to build this really crucial process. I will say that I don't actually believe that the online space is exactly the same as the face-to-face -face space. I don't think we'll ever... Um, I have made some very, very good friends online and have met them 10 years after and have found myself to be very, very close to them when I meet them in person. It's still not the same. Uh, we're still humans, there are still smells and looks and things that are not the same online. 
but I still think you can make very close and very important connections in the internet space. I think the first thing is about letting go of the technology. What makes games fun and certain situations fun and engaging and others not um, is the role of autonomy and choice. Um, if I were told what to do and which path to, to pick in every game I played, wouldn't play them for long. So they have, they have that role. On the other hand, this is one that I, that I really grapple with a lot in my own teaching designs because um, we also know that there's a couple of learning approaches and mechanisms that students are just very unlikely to do on their own. Um, one of these is testing and quizzing. So we have a pile of research showing that retrieval practice, testing, active self-quizzing, those things produce huge results on study time invested. Um, but students' um, preferred method of study, we know from surveys as well as the wisdom of experience, is to sit with a textbook and reread and, and highlight it. So, you know, what do I do in that situation when I, the expert, know that here's the method of engagement with material that is the most likely to work and it's not what you want to do, um, it's not what you would spontaneously choose for yourself, I'm constantly having to balance those two things. And, you know, part of it has to do with, you know, we'd, we'd do, we, we would practice differently if it's a first year seminar or a 100 level class versus a graduate seminar. But for me, I, I still, even if it were fairly advanced students, if they're insisting to me that they learn best in this one particular modality, and I know that that's very, very unlikely, I don't know whether, um, whether I ought to allow that as a path in the course. So that's one that I'm still, still working on. I don't have an answer yet, but it's definitely, uh, it's definitely I think, a, a dynamic that engaged teachers um, have to face in one way or another. So why is feedback so important? Um, for learning and for our, our continued engagement. What is it in the mind that uh, makes feedback so powerful? Um, well, there's probably not just one thing. There's probably a host of different mechanisms in the mind um, that get drawn in when we get some kind of information back from the environment that has to do with our own performance. Um, if we're gonna remember that the, the mind is set up to help us survive in an environment, that's, that's really the big, the big purpose what could be more valuable than feedback to know should I keep doing the same thing or is there something else that I should do that would be more effective. Um, people do tend to be, not in a bad way, but we are um, the center of our own universes, right? And so we know that self-relevance is important for a wide factor, a wide range of things including memory. So feedback makes it clear that hey this does relate to me after all. It's a response to something that I put out there. And it has to do um, with some mechanisms specifically in motivation um, as well. So we know that people do tend to um, enter a much more engaged state of mind when they are getting frequent feedback. So if you think about things like video games, you know, why are video games so engaging? People will literally play them for days on end if, until they, they are exhausted. Well, it's not just about, you know, the story or the noises or the animation or, or this or that. A lot of it has to do with the fact that games are feedback machines. Games tell you right away and constantly, oh, here's what happens when you do this. Here's what happens when you do this. If I had to wait a week for my Halo game to tell me, hey, here's how you did, I doubt that I'd stick with that game for very long. So there's a constellation of things that make feedback really crucial. Our perspective on the relationship between technology and education is that um, both technology shapes education and education shapes technology. So it's a it's kind of a codependent relationship in a lot of ways. Um, we are, our research is largely guided by uh, social shaping theories. So um, we believe that technologies are created by people and as such they embed people's beliefs and assumptions in them, and in that way, they you know those beliefs and assumptions can infiltrate the environment in which the technologies are embedded. So let me give you an example. Um, let's say someone creates a new discussion board application, right? And um, 
for, uh, for various reasons, to solve various problems or because they can create a more beautiful app or a more usable app or whatever. Um, so this person that creates this application um, has a belief, maybe implicit, that the instructor is kind of the king or queen of the classroom, right? That they, um, they're the ones that have the control and so that belief makes it into the application by allowing only the instructor to create threads, right? So you have this app, you're the professor, you start threads, students respond. Um, you have this other person that's creating the same app. And this person believes that the classroom should be a democratic place and therefore creates an app that allows everyone to create discussion threads. Right, so those two different people's beliefs make it into the design of that technology, and once embedded in the you know classroom, it's used in different ways because of those other people's beliefs. Right, so, so that's what I say when that's what I mean when I say that technology is socially shaped. Um, now, at the same time, once you know, once these technologies get integrated into the learning environment, they tend to get appropriated. So people might use them in ways that were not intended. So they might use them, even though they might support interesting pedagogies, people might use them to do the same things that they used to do, right? The simple example is the learning management system. Um, it has a lot of different features, but a lot of people use it as kind of a, um, a digital reading shelf, right? I'm gonna put my papers there, you can download them. Not that it's, it doesn't allow, you know, ease of access and so on, but it doesn't do anything pedagogically interesting. Um, at the same time, other individuals might use uh, the, the learning management systems to do interesting things, and even things that the learning management system doesn't really support, right? Uh, so. I've seen a lot of people put students in groups and do discussions, even though there's not really a tool that allows people to, you know, that allows faculty members to quickly put students in groups for those discussions. So it's, um, it's a really messy process, right? And it's a really messy um, environment to be in. And I think what we need to understand is that all of those things happen at the same time. There's no, you know, one thing that um, that we can say happens. We can't just say, well, technology is going to shape education, so therefore we need better technology. Uh, we're dealing with people, and people are going to, you know, be creative. Uh, they might be ready to retire. You know, there's there's all these things that shape what happens. Technohedagogy is the art and science of using technology to assist learners in directing their own learning experience. And I think it's important as a philosophy because technology can be a, a huge asset or it can be a huge waste of time. One example of technology would be a learning management system. The internet gives us the opportunity to have uh, content, uh, interactivity, assessment, blogging, wikis, etc. Throwing all of these components into a student's learning program doesn't make it a good course. Throwing multimedia at a student doesn't make it a good course. If there's no pedagogical uh, application or purpose for the technology, then it's probably just wasting bandwidth and time. So the instructional designer and the instructor have to reach an agreement that you apply technology only when it's appropriate. Now, technohutagogy uh, rears its presence when you take a multimedia experience and find ways for the student to pay attention to it, to then engage with the content and exchange what they got from it and reflect upon how it impacts them. I think one of the, one of the ways that technohutagogy has directed our attention to uh, the learner is we can then question the learner on 
What is it that you have benefited from that you think might change the way you think about this or the way you will behave in the future on this thing? So to reflect upon the impact of the learning experience, sort of it's like a metacognition idea, uh, allows them to find personal relevance and meaningfulness in the learning. That, that's motivational and that's attention getting and uh, students uh, appreciate the fact that what they're learning does have relevance to their, to their future. It's about ownership. So if you own the space, then your students never own the space. It never becomes theirs. It never becomes their experience. And they don't make those kinds of permanent connections because someday you turn the computer off or you turn the course off and all the connections they made go away. So, you know, and, and Jim Groom has done tons of work on this, uh, DS106, all those guys. Uh, domain of one's own, that kind of stuff, where students are encouraged to find their own space and make their own places. Um, there are downsides to that, there are challenges there, but I think that in order to have those kinds of experiences, you need to take, <sighs> let me step back, Caesar and Cicero are the only known students, at least that I know of, who ever met Apollonius in Rhodes. Let's say that Apollonius taught 100 students in the course of his lifetime. Let's say it's 1,000. Still not a lot of people. If we're going to assume that millions and millions and millions and billions of people are going to find those relationships with people who are going to be important mentors to them, important colleagues to them, we're going to need an awful lot of ways in which people encounter people they don't expect where they run into people in ways that are not organized specifically by the people one professor happens to know. So we need to create events in online spaces that allow people to use the scalability of the internet to deal with the scalability we're talking about here. So if you want to scale up from a thousand people work with Molin in a lifetime to a billion people make connections online, your classrooms have to allow people to interact with other people, right? And not through your own range, through their own. And then you have to deal with all the problems with that. All of the potential trolls, all the potential nasty people out there, all that stuff, which is like life. And if our schools inevitably, what is it Illich says, and I can never, I never get this quote right, but the school system is the marketing we do to convince people that they want society as it is. Um, hopefully I got it right this time. Uh, but ideally, it reflects society as we want it to be um, and helps people with the literacies they need to, to deal with that society as it is. And those trolls and those mean people are out there now. Um, you know, we're working right now, we have an election on PEI, 143,000 people on PEI. Not a lot of places to hide. We've got a couple of trolls who are trolling the political candidates. And I've got people from all sides of the political spectrum who are banding together to stand against them and to say, look, you're being an unmitigated ass and you are not, you know, you're not representing yourself, you're doing this maliciously and we don't want you here. Those are the kinds of things that people need to learn how to do or else the internet's gonna stay the crazy, mean, wild west that it can be. So I think that having those things in the classroom, allowing for the unexpected, teaching people how to deal with the unexpected, both allows for those unplanned, wonderful events and also allows us to provide people with the literacies that they don't currently have. It is really uh, interesting to see uh, how we can do things like apply our all this research on testing and you know self quizzing and so forth that's just a pile of research in a journal until somebody turns it into a workable solution that actually fits into a class so having the opportunity to take theory um, and turn it into practice is always lots and lots of fun instructional design usually focuses on efficiency effectiveness and engagement in our research, we proposed that uh, there's two other indicators of good, good instruction or good learning, and those are um, socially just instruction and um, 
and transformational instruction. So these latter two have to do with, so let me give you an example to illustrate uh, socially just instruction. Um, a course might be effective, it might teach what it's supposed to teach to people. Uh, it might do it efficiently, right, and it might be engaging. But it might exclude large segments of the population. So it might be a sexist course, right? Um, so that's one indicator that we've added. And the second one we added in order to encourage people to kind of aspire uh, and to higher outcomes, to get people to think more about, well, how can this course have a great impact on someone's life? How could we develop this course that a person can change the way that they look at the world, at the discipline, uh, that two years down the road they would look back to that course and think that course had an impact on me. Um, so studying those things and understanding those things allows us to improve that particular course, but also allows us to improve you know, future courses in the discipline or in general. One of the most striking things about online learning and its, and its growth um, in this new era we're in is just how unbelievably enthusiastic um, individuals are. Uh, there are people who choose to devote their whole lives and careers in way more effort than they would have to um, just because we're so excited about how it's all going to play out. I think there'll be a constant reshaping. So in, in, on the one hand I'm saying yes, that we should expect that, right? That the institutions of education should be responsive to society. Now I have colleagues at Penn State who argue and say no, the university shapes society. Basically we've been here longer than, you know, and we've had this amazing impact. Only religion and higher education really are the only long-standing institutions and we shape society. But it's a co it's a co-evolution of society and, and institutions of higher education. And it was one thing when people didn't have as much voice and as much opportunity as they do now. It's one thing to sort of I'll use the word subjugate, which I, I'm not sure that's an appropriate word to say what higher education has done to the population. But um, it's easier to subjugate a population when they you know, have very little opportunity to communicate with each other and very few options. Um, they now have options and the ability to communicate and the ability to understand what's going on anywhere. Uh, changes can be viral and so on. So I think it's, it's now we're in a place where it will be very much a co evolution and universities responding to the demands of learners. Um, I think that's, I think for, you know, I'm, I'm reluctant when I think about the variety of learners we have and the variety of people in the world. Um, I don't know that they'll all make wise choices, but I think that there still is a very good opportunity to, to produce a, a portfolio of educational opportunities and let students decide which of those opportunities make sense for them. Let employers decide which ones to encourage their future employees to uh, enroll in and so on. So I think that the good ideas come back. I have a, on my door of my office, I have a Calvin and Hobbes cartoon that used to have three panels and I, I don't remember what the third panel was because I just cut it off. The first panel says, the secret is being in the right place at the right time. And the second panel says, since you never know what the right time is, get in the right place and hang around. Right? So these things like competency-based education, that's not a new idea. It's been around for a long time and it has come and gone in popularity. But this time, I think, is the time where it sticks. I think this is a right time now because of all the higher cost of education going through the roof, the uh, social media, Online shopping has changed everybody's expectations of the kind of information they'll have and the kind of choices they'll have in buying a credential and uh, you know, the granularity of things they can buy. You don't, you don't have to go in and buy a whole living room suite. You can just buy one chair, right? And you can, when you want to buy a chair, you can go and see the chairs from everybody and sort them by cost and sort them by color. And, and we're going to be able to do the same sort of thing with learning opportunities. So I think that uh, your university was ahead of its time. I taught in the, in the 60s, I taught in an open space classroom that was then walled off later. Uh, and I understand both the value and the issues with that. But again, that was sort of moving from one size fits all to another one size fits all. And I'd like to see different approaches used for different learning outcomes. So knowledge and comprehension level outcomes you have a lot of opportunities for that can be distributed through open educational resources and tested 
And sort of machines can do a lot of that and individuals and peers can do a lot of that together. But then when you get into higher order stuff, it's very different. And I would want different kinds of opportunities for that. So I think I look forward to the day, <clears throat> it may not be in my lifetime, but I hope, it, I hope it will be, where we start not using, making media decisions based on the whole degree level or the whole course level. But say this piece of it, these outcomes can be done in this way and these outcomes at the higher level have to be done in a synchronous role play, developed and followed by a reflection, followed by an expert review of that reflection, followed by you know, an interaction and things like that. So I think we're going to get to the point where everything we know about how people learn and instructional design gets applied. And the ones who do it well, I think, will succeed and the ones who don't, won't. But even the ones who do it well will consistently question that. Is that still the right approach to do five years from now, three years from now? Um, so fun times ahead and lots of job security for instructional designers. Start small. That's, that's all. If you try to do all of this at the same time, like I've seen so many people try to do this stuff and have it just like your students are not going to be ready for the responsibility we're talking about. So you walk into a classroom and you say, okay, so you guys are in charge. I've had, I've had, I've had 40 year old students cry in my classrooms when I tell them that I'm not going to tell them what the objectives are because I don't know them yet. Right? So take a small piece of what you're doing. Something that involves complexity. Something in your field or what you're covering and I don't care what you're doing, complexity exists. I taught academic writing for years. That's a scripted process but at some point you have to make that argument. Right? And argumentation is a complex situation. So do all the APA garbage the same way that you had to do it before, but take that one piece, take 20% of your grade if you're forced into that, and make it complex. Allow them to go out and build the curriculum. Allow them to go out and bring their world in. We've been doing this for generations, but we don't see it as a direction. Right? And if we can take those pieces and see it as the direction we're heading to, and then expand out a little bit. We're always going to end up with a little piece of that stuff that's scripted. Expand it out. Give that responsibility to your students. They're going to learn. You're going to learn. And then your classrooms are going to be way more fun.